So far in his letter, Paul has talked about the need for justification in Romans 1, the way of justification in Romans 3. And now here in Romans 5, he talks about the benefits, the fruits, the results, if you like, of justification. Paul starts Romans 5 with the word, therefore. And that's a sure sign we better go back and read chapter 4. So we'll know what he's referring to. Now, chapter 4 is all about Abraham who believed God's promise and God credits it, credited it to him as righteousness. Paul has just explained how Gentiles who believe in Jesus are true children of Abraham, even though they aren't Jewish. Abraham wasn't even Jewish, Paul points out, because Jewish means descended from Judah and Judah was Abraham's great grandson. It was Abraham's faith in God's promise that made him the father of many nations. And our faith in Jesus as a fulfillment of that promise is what makes us true heirs of righteousness. In other words, you don't have to become Jewish to become a Christian. That, it's faith that matters. And that's chapter four. Therefore, Paul says here in chapter five, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because of his son, Jesus, who gives us access to the grace in which we stand. Jesus opened the way for us to be reconciled to God, to be made right with God, to have peace with God. And verse 2 says, And we rejoice in the hope of that glory of God. The, the NRSV says boast. We rejoice or we boast in hope. Now, hope here is not like people generally use the word hope. I sure hope that pizza comes on time. I hope I don't get fired tomorrow. I hope the stock market makes a turnaround soon. Christian hope is not uncertain like our ordinary everyday hopes about the weather or about our health. It's a joyful and confident expectation which rests on the promises of God. And as was the case with Abraham, biblical hope is not wishing for some good luck but it's future looking faith in what God will do. So what do we have hope for? Paul tells us that we hope, what we hope for is nothing less than the glory of God. Throughout the Bible, the term glory identifies a person's core being as it is exposed, as it's revealed to the world. Paul is saying that what we can hope for is a life lived in close relationship with God, where we can experience God's glory for all eternity. Our hope is in knowing and being known by God so intimately that God completely reveals himself to us. This kind of hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us, verse 5 tells us. What God reveals to us in his glory is God's love. God's nature is love and God pours that love onto us through the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 in the message says, In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our life through the Holy Spirit. That is what we hope for, to love and to be loved so completely, so fully, that it can never be contained. This kind of hope is dangerous. It's unpredictable and it's out of our control. That kind of hope can motivate us to do amazing things, seemingly impossible things. We need to hope dangerously in the glory of God, to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us with God's love, fill us to overflowing, so that God's great love for us spills over into other, others' hearts. That is contagious holiness, being so set apart for God's love, for his glory, that others can't help but catch that hope. Those hearts may belong to people who don't agree with us on how to best interpret scripture. They, they may belong to people who don't look like us or act like us or think like us, but hope will not be contained. God's love will, will not be able to be contained. So, so go ahead. I encourage you, hope dangerously in the love of God who created you and redeemed you and sustains you and see what God might do. But I mean, let's keep it real. Throughout the history of humankind, our relationship with God has been anything but peaceful. From the moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, people have been fighting against God. God. 
And even when we try our hardest to stay in God's will, even when we strive to submit, we mess up. The human condition is not naturally one of peace. It's one of conflict. And the lack of peace is demonstrated every day in the news. Perhaps even more sobering, we often don't even seem to have to look much outside our own home, our own families to find the absence of peace. This universal lack of peace, as bad as it is, is only symptomatic of a deeper problem, the lack of peace between God and man. Sin separates us from God and we were helpless to do anything about it. But Paul says that God did something about it. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Standing justified before God doesn't mean that we'll always feel at peace or have peace in our hearts and homes. This peace is far better. This is an objective peace, a peace that exists outside of us, regardless of what's happening in our lives. Our relationship with God has been changed. Instead of being his enemies, we're now his friends, his children. That's all good news. But if we stopped there, we might leave with a bit of a skewed view of the Christian life, a view that unfortunately many Christians actually hold. It's the view and the expectation that because Jesus has established peace with God, that we will experience peace in our lives here and now. And that's not true. Rather, Paul present, presents a paradox, that of finding joy in the reality of our suffering. Hope is future looking faith in what God will do. But that masterpiece of hope in what God will do is cultivate it, cultivated in us through suffering. Verse 3 says, And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Rejoicing in Christ's suffering is one thing. His suffering is over. He's now reigning in heaven's glory. But rejoicing in my suffering? That's something else entirely different. In fact, isn't it when we're suffering that we're most tempted to doubt God's love? To believe that Christ's suffering was all for nothing? Isn't that when we're most tempted to give up our hope in God? How can you suffer possibly or how can your suffering possibly lead to joy and to hope? Because we know that where the road of suffering starts and where it ends, that's why. It starts with hope, the hope of the glory of God. And suffering leads to perseverance. Perseverance is the quality of resistance, or sorry, of resilience under adversity. Perseverance leads to character. And the picture hot behind this word character comes from the testing of metals by refining them with fire. Character is only formed through testing, trials and pressure. And when we've been put through the ringer and come out the other side, what is the result? Paul comes full circle and says that an even greater hope is ours. You know, our English word suffering or the older translation say tribulation comes from a Latin word tribulum. In Paul's day, this was the heavy piece of timber with spikes on it and it was used for threshing the grain. The tribulum was drawn over the grain and it separated the wheat from the chaff. And as we go through tribulations, as we depend on God's grace, the trials purify us and help us to get rid of that chaff, help us to become his holy people. Paul says, we, re we rejoice in hope, yes, but what's more, we rejoice in suffering. Not because our suffering, or not because of our suffering, but we rejoice through our suffering. We rejoice in the suffering, in the middle of it, because we know where it leads. The sequence is suffering, perseverance, proven character, hope. And this path forward involves an act of faith, much like Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God's promises, even though it didn't look like the promises would ever be fulfilled. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. And because he believed, it was credited to him as righteousness, verse 3 tells us in Romans 4. It's hard to trust God when everything seems to be going wrong. But faith, C.S. Lewis wrote, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. This is the faith that leads to peace with God, 
If I allow my mind to change about things with every passing mood I find myself in, that would be a total roller coaster of peace and hope, anxiety and despair. That's why for me, a daily practice of reading God's word and reminding myself of God's promises and faithfulness is so important to ground me in, in which that which I already know is true about God and about me. A daily trusting of God to set me right instead of trying to be right on my own. When Paul wrote about peace with God, his readers would have understood it in a particular context. That context was the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Rome offered peace to the world on its terms. Peace would come with Rome's victory over its enemies, and those enemies included anyone who stood in its way. Now, Rome did bring peace to the Mediterranean world. Its navy controlled the seas, making them safe from pirates. The Roman legions built and patrolled a major highway system that made travel safer and trade and commerce more profitable. So if you submitted to Rome's power, life would be calm and maybe even prosperous. There might be war on the borders, but inside the borders of, of the empire, life flowed on peacefully. But this isn't the kind of peace Paul offers to the Roman church. He offers them shalom, which involves much more than an absence of war and violence. This peace was something that one could experience even in the midst of suffering. It was that inner calm that allows us to persevere and find hope even in the midst of difficult times. It might appear as weakness, especially to the Roman world, but it was the path to peace that surpasses understanding. When we talk about the relationship between suffering and finding peace with God, it's so important that we remember Paul knew what it meant to suffer. He endured being beaten and in prison. He was shipwrecked three times. He had what he called his thorn in the flesh that he never identified, though I think his readers knew what he was talking about. Some think he was blind, others think he might have suffered from epilepsy or depression or a broken relationship. But despite his challenges in life, whatever they may be, he seemed to understand the power of God's grace, which provides peace with God. And if there is peace with God, then there could be peace with others. In essence, that's what righteousness means, a right relationship with God, which leads to right relationships with others. While Paul speaks here of suffering, he doesn't say that suffering is a sign of divine punishment for sin. So the coronavirus isn't God's punishment for any particular sin. And the same is true for earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes or any other disaster. As the book of Job reminds us, bad things happen to good people. But sin does create an environment of brokenness that needs to be healed. That's because sin disrupts our ability to trust in God's grace. One of the big questions posed to people of faith has to do with the presence of God in the midst of suffering. And I've recently found great wisdom and much help in the, the teachings of theologians like Jürgen Moltmann, who tells us that God goes with us, that God suffers with us. God may not always rescue us from suffering, but God experiences it with us. God provides the grace that sustains us. And the grace of God is best expressed, I believe, in community, when we support each other. That can happen in so many different ways. It might start with a prayer, it might in include a phone call to another person. It may involve running errands for one another, especially if someone in the community is feeling vulnerable or anxious. And it certainly requires us to love one another. So how do we do, deal with the discouragement of suffering? How do we deal with all the pain of suffering in the world? Do we fight against it as if it's a sign of God's judgment or lack of blessing, as if we have failed once again? Or do we realize the amazing good news that God has entered into this messy thing called being human and joins us in our suffering to work out our salvation through the ongoing, often painful process of growing together in God's love? As we grow in holiness, as we become love as God is love, may we walk together through our suffering and grow in the grace of God. For this is our hope.